Welcome to the NASIC 2020 session supporting students, um, OER and textbook affordability initiatives at the Midsize University, presented by Jennifer L. Pate from the University of North Alabama. Please refer to SCED for a complete biography of the speaker. We will be using the Zoom Q&A for questions during the session. Afterwards, please also participate in our online discussion forum, which can be located at the NASIC website with additional questions or comments about this session. NASIC's Code of Conduct applies to all discussions and presentations. The links to the forum and Code of Conduct are available on the NASIC website. Please tweet about this session using the hashtag NASIC2020. We would like to thank the NASIC sponsors for helping us make our online experience uh, uh, freely available. Um, thank you. Just a little background. Uh, as I said, I'm Jennifer Pate and I'm a Scholarly Communications and Instructional Services Librarian at the University of North Alabama. I have been at UNA, this August will be three years, and I was hired initially to um, start the institutional repository on the campus to build campus support for that. But I wear quite a few different hats there. I'm also an instruction librarian. I do first year instruction. I also um, I'm a liaison to the uh, Department of Foreign Languages and the Department of English, and I do instruction for them. Um, I'm also the touch person for copyright and fair use questions, and of course, OER. Um, I wear a lot of different hats because we are a mid-sized university. We are located in the northwest corner of Alabama, and um, we are an M1 university, and we're hoping that uh, COVID notwithstanding, that's going to change in the coming year. We're hoping to launch our first two doctoral programs in the coming academic year. But right now we're um, an M1 university and we have, um, we just hit 8,000 students this past fall. We were very, very excited about that. So we are, we are on the smaller side of the mid-sized university. So I want to give you some background about the uh, textbook affordability initiative and OER at UNA. Um, back in 2018, the Alabama Commission on Higher Education, uh, which has what I think is one of the best acronyms in the world, ACHE, and the Alabama Community College System got together and decided that they wanted to start a statewide OER initiative similar to the one that um, our next door neighbor, Affordable Learning Georgia, had started. And so to that end, they invited Affordable Learning Georgia folks over to kind of teach them at the um, administrative level. And then they held a series of workshops throughout the state. Um, when they came to the northwest corner of Alabama, I wasn't able to go to that workshop, but some of the other library faculty and some of our university admin did go to the workshop and they came back kind of really excited about OER. And I was excited that they were excited about OER because again, that was part of my, my role and my duties within the library. Um, one of the things the administration um, prompted us to do at the university level was to apply for one of the grants that uh, AIC and ACCS had. And I partnered with some folks from the College of Education on a grant for a high enrollment course. Uh, we were successful in getting that grant and uh, they rolled out some OER. They did uh, um, traditional textbook in the fall and OER textbook in the spring. And then they assessed uh, student retention, student outcomes, and students' perception of the learning materials with that OER. Um, and of course, OER, I say of course because I'm a fan of OER, but of course, the OER had uh, across the board uh, better numbers than the traditional textbook in the fall. Um, the provost also asked our um, head of educational tech services and that's uh, his name is John and John runs our uh, canvas platform and he also supervises our instructional designers and a cataloging librarian if they would kind of kick off an OER initiative on campus and they came to me and asked me if I would help them with this and so the three of us sort of formed an ad hoc working group on campus to try to generate some interest in OER and uh, Call Your Library was kind of in flux at the time. We had um, two different interim librarians with administrative changes. And the second um, 
interim librarian came in and really wanted to enhance our course reserves and our e-reserves program to support um, faculty teaching goals and to save students money. So that's the whole overview of the program. But kind of on a granular level, this all happened very, very quickly. Um, so this is kind of the timeline of how it happened. So July 2018, that informal working group sort of got cobbled together. And the first thing we needed to do was do a faculty assessment. We needed to see what people knew about OER and where we needed to, uh, what we needed to do to kind of advance the idea of OER on campus. Um, one of the things the administration did is they actually explicitly wrote OER into the campus strategic plan. It's called Roaring with Excellence because at UNA we are the lion, so everything usually has a lion connotation. Um, and Roaring with Excellence, uh, the 2019 to 2024 plan, has an aspirational goal of uh, having OER adoption in 50% of the academic programs on campus. So we really needed to know what our baseline was so we could assess that 50% goal. Um, in August of this past year, our interim librarian actually became our permanent university librarian, and he kind of revised the textbook affordability initiative that he had started um, and enhanced it in a lot of ways, and I'll talk about that in more detail. In December of this past year, our working group was formalized. Uh, the president of our university, who um, is uh, not just a fan of OER, but actually teaches a course at the university in political science, and he uses all OER in his course. Uh, he sent a memorandum to shared governance um, with specific charges and duties for our working group. And kind of, we changed the makeup of the group. Uh, the other librarian rolled off the group. I stayed on and John, the ETS director, stayed on. But we added four other members. We added a tenured faculty member. We added a non-tenure track instructional faculty member. We added a student engagement uh, staff person who works with our uh, food pantry and our at-risk students. And we also added an undergraduate student who um, is uh, pretty typical of the students who are on our campus. He does not live on campus. He lives at home over in Muscle Shoals across the bridge. And he uh, works and he um, is very, very interested in promoting the idea of OER because uh, text, textbook costs and tuition costs are very high. And then uh, I'll talk a little bit later about our stipend program. We call it a stipend program because that's the language that has been used for other similar programs on campus. Other places usually call it a grant program. It's basically the same thing. We just use the term stipend because that's the terms that our campus used. That kicked off last month, and I'll talk in more detail about that as we go through the presentation. So, Usually in academia, things move very, very, very slow. This moved very, very, very fast um, and a lot of moving pieces with it. Um, but it's important. And why is it important? Well, it's important because if we want to make higher education really equitable, we have to do something about rising textbook costs. Um, most of you probably know that textbook costs have outpaced inflation by a significant amount. Um, you can see from the numbers here, the 88% of inflation from 2006 to 2016, over a thousand percent inflation since 1977 in the cost of textbooks. Um, but the number that's really stark for me, and this comes from the Florida um, survey of student textbook and course materials, and to me, um, reading that is kind of like reading a horror novel because it's just so, uh, kind of stark and depressing is 64 percent of students are not purchasing the retired textbooks for their classes and when that happens you know there's correlations with that there are lower grades there's lower retention there's lower graduation rates um you know if if they don't have the textbook to learn the material it is going to have this snowball effect and affect so many different things for that student um, and, you know, they're making stark choices between purchasing a textbook and, you know, purchasing food for the month. And that's just not something that should happen. 
and it's not getting any better. We're still going up at almost 5% per year. And then we have to contend with the inclusive access products. Um, these are complicated and um, problematic. They have co-opted a lot of the language of uh, open education resources, and they sound like a really good deal, right? You know, day one access for students, um, you know, all of your tests and your worksheets and, you know, lesson planning, it's all packaged in there and for one low price. And a lot of times that price is cheaper than a textbook if they buy the textbook brand new. But as we know, most students will shop around for the best textbook price, or they could even use the course reserve of the textbook if we have it. They can also sell the textbook back at the end of the semester and get back at least a fraction of what they paid. But none of that happens with inclusive access products at all. The students end up with zero ownership of any of the material that they've used in an inclusive access model. And this past year, Cengage and McGraw-Hill, um, and you can see their market shares there, 24% uh, and 21%, they actually proposed that they would merge. And then they would have had a 45% market share, which would put them in league with Pearson, which also has a significant market share, which would have made it basically a duopoly, and they could have set whatever prices they wanted. And it was a bad thing, and it failed. And I'm glad. So, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to make this stuff equitable? Um, I want to talk first about Call Your Library, and that's a picture of Call Your Library right there, and what they're doing, um, what we're doing, really, they, you know, I don't work there anymore. No, I do. Um, <laughs> what we're doing with the textbook affordability initiative. There are three components to the textbook affordability initiative. Uh, course reserves is the first one that I'm going to talk about, and that's generally for high enrollment courses with high cost materials. There's e-resources, which is strategic journal, ebook, and database purchases. And then there's supporting OER, which is working with our faculty uh, to help them discover OER and also working um, with me and supporting the work that I'm doing with OER and giving me the time to put on that OER hat amongst all the other hats that I wear so that I can um, make sure that we are promoting OER across campus. So first let's talk about course reserves. Initially, when uh, Derek Malone, who's our university librarian, came as the interim, um, he wanted to increase our course reserves. And he worked with the bookstore and got a book list from them and had access services check that against all of our high enrollment classes, you know, classes with multiple sections. And those were flagged on that, that list provided by the bookstore. And materials that we already had on reserve were then noted. And then we tried to, as a library, purchase what we could out of the rest of the list. Um, textbooks, films, workbooks. That's changed uh, in the past year. The list that the, was provided by the bookstore was great, but it wasn't uh, the easiest list to use. And another facet is that we are really about embedded librarianship. So we really wanted to make sure that we were connecting with our faculty and our departments on a kind of a deeper level to support their educational goals. So one of the ways that we do that is every March and October, we work with them to get a copy of the lists that they're sending to the bookstore. Uh, this way they know that we're actively pursuing purchasing textbooks for the courses that they're offering each semester. We still check the enrollment, but in addition, liaison librarians are also reaching out to the departments to say, hey, you know, is there something else that needs to be on reserve that maybe isn't for a high enrollment cost uh, class, but has a high cost or is hard to, to get? Um, and we also ask them, like, hey, do you have review copies of the textbooks, or do you have an extra copy that you would loan to us to put on the shelf that would save us money from buying it, but would also save your students money because they could come in and check it out? Um, in each phase of the program, even when we did the bookstore book list or when we're you know, now that we're working directly with departments, one of the other things that liaison librarians do is they talk to their faculty and they talk to their departments and they say, please let your students know that we have these textbooks. Put it in your syllabus. Make sure that this information is getting communicated to them so that they know that if they can't afford to buy the book, we have that book for them. Um, 
we have started assessing the program. We don't have any um, broad numbers to share yet, but we do know that assessment, you know, we live and die by our numbers and assessment is incredibly important for funding library materials. We need to show, you know, how much usage, how much we are saving the students by doing this. Um, one interesting assessment that has come out of uh, the COVID crisis is the library, of course, shut down as many libraries did across the United States um, for students. But um, our university librarian would go in every day to fulfill requests from students. Our number one request was for laptops. We are, like I said, a primarily you know, regional, a very rural university. A lot of students don't have access to electronic technology. They would want to check out laptops for use. The second thing was course reserves. Students wanted course reserves. So that was the number two item that got fulfilled every single day during that brief window of no contact operation. The second part of the textbook affordability initiative is e-resources. Um, databases, journals and ebooks, and streaming media. Um, it kind of started with Visible Body. Visible Body was purchased, uh, we thought, you know, this will be great for biology, this will be great, you know, for them to use uh, in their labs in conjunction with stuff, but it actually worked really great for our nursing program and our kinesiology program as well. And for nursing in particular, it actually ended up taking the place of some um, course materials that would cost students money, um, but they could access it for free through the library databases. Uh, a newer database that we just purchased was the slavery, is the slavery and anti-slavery database. We have a new minor at UNA started this past year, uh, Black Studies, and I worked with the faculty in Black Studies. Um, and we had the option to do a trial or to purchase. And what's really great about having purchased this database is that it, it also gives us the opportunity to really work with faculty to instruct them on why it's so important that they permalink. We have a lot of faculty who still don't understand permalinking and they will um, just, you know, download something and throw it in their Canvas course shell and we try to make sure that they know that they have to permalink because we're going to look at the per use cost of our databases. And so, you know, we need to emphasize that if you are using this in your courses, if you are leveraging this material as a, as a teaching tool, um, to save your students money. We need to know that so that we know that um, it's being used and we don't cancel it because we do not have unlimited funds. I don't know any library that does. Uh, the newest database that we're trying to uh, figure out how to integrate it into the curriculum is Flipster. And um, when I get into talking about um, our OER Provost stipend program, um, we actually have uh, a grant or stipend application for one of our creative writing programs. Um, and I've been working with the faculty member who um, is, is doing that to see how he can leverage some of the um, journals that are in Flipster for some of the creative writing exercises that he is having the students do in his course. With the journals and ebooks, um, it started with SP202. And uh, Dr. AB, who is uh, this incredible foreign language Spanish instructor at our university, came to me and she said, I have a problem, Jennifer. The book that I use for 202, which it's a intermediate Spanish with a literature component, it's gone out of print. What can I do? So we sat down and we looked at the literature pieces, the short stories and the poems that she wanted to use. And we decided to apply fair use and public domain guidelines for many of those pieces, which meant purchasing that material as well. Some we had to purchase in, um, you know, traditional print, but others we were able to get uh, through our electronic, um, uh, our ebook platforms. And that was great because then she could build that course at no cost to the students using these materials, not necessarily replicating the other book because she did change pieces, so she wasn't replicating the book that went out of print, but it gave her that freedom to look for other poetry and uh, uh, short stories that she could use um, leveraging library resources at no cost to her students. Um, 
because of that, we have a proposal now for one of the stipends from uh, the History 479-579, which is History of Religion in, the, uh, in America. And this instructor came to me and said, I really want to put in a proposal for one of your stipends, but I'm not sure if I can do this. She had three books that she used for this course that would have cost students over $130. And she came with this proposal that includes one journal article, but chapters from over 20 different books. And she said, I can create this course, you know, whole cloth from this material, but will my students have access to it? I don't want to do a proposal if this isn't going to work. So I uh, spoke with uh, Derek and we worked uh, closely with, and I cannot say enough about this, our collection development uh, librarian, Amy Butler, has been a godsend through this whole process. She has been amazing. She checked the licenses on the 20 ebooks. Do we have them? Can we get them? Is it concurrent? Is it one? Is it three? How many people can use the book at one time? You know, uh, there were so many different facets to this. And she did a kind of comprehensive analysis of that and came back and we said, yeah, this, this is doable. So Dr. Kiros, who teaches that class, put in a proposal um, for a stipend, which is under review right now. And the third part is streaming media. Um, the ASL 101, 102, those are sign language classes and EN 391 is a film authors class. Those classes used films that were on reserve. Um, the film authors class, the instructor would actually take them and show them in class and discuss them in class. The um, ASL was an assignment for students once they got home, you know, watch one, check out one of the movies, watch it, write a reflection piece on it. Um, that was affected by the closure and by COVID. And one of the things that we had to do was quickly try to get these integrated, what we could, what was available into our streaming services so that students were not required to go out and pay money to access a platform that it might be available on, whether it was Amazon or Netflix or Hulu, or to rent it from a platform like Apple or YouTube or Amazon Prime. So uh, we leveraged our streaming media licenses uh, so that we could get those. The SP652 and Foreign Languages FL101, uh, that's an introduction to uh, global uh, studies. And the SP is a, a graduate course in Latin American literature. Um, the instructor came to us and a lot of foreign language films, very hard for students to find. We were able to purchase some through our streaming services uh, so that students would not have to go out and rent or buy those movies. Um, and they also wouldn't have to come into the library to get them. Some of the films we do have on the shelf, the rest we got through streaming services. The third part of the textbook affordability initiative was supporting OER. And so I'm just going to go right into the campus OER initiative because, you know, that's what they're doing. They're supporting OER by supporting the work that I am doing. So the first thing, like I said, we did was we did a faculty survey, a climate survey. What do they know about OER? What do faculty think about OER? And these were our key takeaways. These four takeaways was that on campus, there's a lack of or limited awareness of OER. The second part is that faculty are aware. They're very aware of what the cost of course materials are for their students um, and they're concerned about it. And that's great, but they're unsure about how to find that OER. Um, and they also don't know how to evaluate OER. Like they don't, they, they are just like, help me find it. Help, is this going to be good? Is it usable? What's a Creative Commons license? I don't know how any of that stuff works. Um, at the time, we did have some faculty who indicated that they uh, used OER in their classes, but it was very, very limited. So we needed to attack first with raising awareness of OER, what it is, how to find it, how to evaluate it. So we invested in some workshops and some education. One of the first things that we did is I had met Will Cross. He works at North Carolina State University at a conference, and I had talked to him about potentially coming to campus to uh, talk to our faculty about OER. And 
he was like, absolutely, I'll come. We had standing room only for his two days of presentation. The first day, he did just like an hour-long presentation to faculty. He did it once in the morning and once in the afternoon so that we could work with multiple faculty schedules. The second day, he did a three-hour workshop for um, our faculty on how to find and use OER. We had standing room only. It was just, it was the reception from that was amazing. Um, I have found that when um, you bring somebody to campus, faculty tend to be more interested. I, I think the correlation is they feel like if it's worth it for you to pay for somebody to come to campus, it's worth it for them to go. Uh, you know, I could have had the same workshops. I don't think I would have gotten the same attendance. We also applied for and were successful at getting the ACRL Skalcom Roadshow, which actually brought Will Cross back to our campus because he's one of the trainers for ACRL. Um, and all of the instructional design fa uh, faculty and all of the library faculty uh, w went to the Roadshow on campus, as well as librarians from across the state, from Mississippi, and from Tennessee. Um, and it was really great. It, we uh, focused it on OER and that was fantastic. The library has also supported uh, my continuing education because, you know, it's like train the trainers. Um, I've done Harvard Copyright X. I've done the Library Copyright Institute. I am currently part of Open Textbook Network's OER certificate. Um, the provost sent the original three members of the working group to open ed this past year. And John, our ETS director, went to the Open Education Southern Symposium last year. In the future, we want to do open stacks. Uh, we want to, you know, we're going to apply to be part of their partnership program. Um, we're hoping to get Kyle Courtney from Harvard uh, down to our neck of the woods to run his copyright first responders program. And this summer for our faculty, especially those who are interested in our program, um, our stipend program, we want to have like regular Zoom hangouts for them. I also wanted to make sure that we were including students in the conversation. Um, having uh, Tevin, our student member of our OER working group, uh, be part of SGA was great because he got me on the agenda at SGA. And in October of last year, I went to SGA to talk about OER and why this stuff matters. Um, and they were really ahead of me already. Sam Ashburn, who was the president of SGA this past year, had signed the resolution from uh, SGA presidents um, across the United States opposing the McGraw-Hill Cengage merger. Um, after my presentation, Tevin drafted a resolution which was passed unanimously in SGA to support OER on campus and they are going to help us promote future assessment and other future awareness programs of OER across campus. And then last month we launched our stipend program. Uh, this is a little bit of the blurb from the uh, announcement that went out to faculty. The provost sent it out to all faculty and it also went out in our uh, digest announcement and this was great. Uh, because our announcement was actually OER that <laughs> I, I borrowed from um, North Carolina State University's textbook affordability initiative. I actually contacted Will Cross and said, I really like your press release. Can I borrow it? And he said, I can send you a clean copy, do what you want with it. And that's the beauty of OER is you can contact people and say, hey, I want to do this. And they say, take it, use it. It's great. So we launched our um, stipend program. We had been working on this the whole time while we were educating ourselves and we were educating faculty and we were educating students. This was all happening in the background the entire time. So what are the stages of the proposal? The first thing is that if faculty express interest, they have to take our Canvas course. I built a Canvas course on uh, introduction to OER, which answers a lot of the basic questions about OER. I built it using OER from Affordable Learning Georgia and Open Washington. Um, once faculty have finished that course, they can submit a proposal. Um, they, it is a rolling submission. Other places do it where they have exact deadlines, but we have a rolling submission for ours, and it's only for new OER. I've, we've already had faculty come up and say, hey, I've been using OER for years, and our provost's response to that is, thank you. We appreciate that, but this is for new OER. 
Um, once the proposals have been submitted, the committee of six review them and recommend funding levels, and then the provost signs off on them, and then we have an agreement that gets signed. And this, uh, Karen, who presented earlier today, was really great, PDX Open. She sent me some of their documentation. I've also used some from the University of Houston for the agreement, and we pay in installments, so they get a part at the beginning of the project. They'll get more when they hit milestones, so it's different for individual projects depending on the scope and the nature of the project. We currently have five projects that we have already funded since May. One that has already rolled out, it is a Lumen Learning product that is happening this summer, and the uh, stipend that we gave paid for the Lumen Learning product at $25 a head for the students. And also the other, it was half went for that and half went to the instructor for adapting. So, I mean, we've hit the ground running with this. Um, we have four more projects under consideration right now that should be funded within the next week or two. Um, and so we're really excited about the amount of interest and activity in this program already because stage four, everyone wins. Students save money, faculty make money, I spend the provost money, it's great. And so that's kind of where we are right now, but where do we wanna go? Um, we wanna do a little bit of assessment. We want to assess learning outcomes. We wanna assess student retention and student grades and student attitudes and faculty attitudes. So there's tons of assessment that's gonna be built into this. Uh, we wanna have OER written into promotion and tenure guidelines. I want to develop LibGuides that have um, suggested OER for all of the courses that we have on campus, which is a huge undertaking. Um, we are currently working on getting courses marked in the catalog so that our students who are consumers can make informed decisions when they choose classes. If there are two classes that are exactly the same, except for one has high cost course materials and one has OER, students should know that information. Um, I would like to develop an awards program for our faculty adopters. Maybe, um, I think it's UT, maybe Knoxville, uh, does something with SGA and the library partners together for that. I'm working on something like that. I wanna have stipends for faculty to review OER because I think that's a really great way for faculty to get their feet wet with OER is to review what's out there. And we wanna leverage the IR to publish OER that is created on our campus. Um, and then I want to take a nap after all of that because I'm tired, y'all. Um, it's a lot of work, but I, I think it's really, really important work. So uh, thank you all for listening. And in my slides, uh, they're already up on the slide share and they'll be in our IR later. Um, I have linked to a bunch of resources, including um, my Open Ed Heroes, which is like PDX Open, University of Houston, and NCSU, some of the tutorials I used, and some of the surveys. So thank you all. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And Jennifer, it does look like you have uh, uh, several questions here. Do you want me to read them out for you to address? Uh, sure. Do we have time for that? I think we have until 2.05. Okay, good. Yay. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um, so this is one from Jennifer Williams. Um, but what percentage are renting textbooks from Amazon or Chegg? Um, I think in response to the different places people are getting textbooks. Yeah, and that's that's the problem with inclusive access is that students don't have that option. Um, my son took a dual enrollment Spanish course this past year and I could have gotten him a rental textbook for $25, but instead I had to pay a couple hundred dollars for an inclusive access product because you couldn't, um, you, you couldn't, that he was doing it online and he had to have that to have the class. And it's just, yeah, I think it's, I think it's, it's kind of criminal <laughs> what's yeah. happening. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, the next one is from Greg Yorba. Were you able to increase the use of permalinks? Yes, actually, after Will Cross came and did his workshop for OER, um, he talked a lot about uh, leveraging library resources. And I, I think there were probably 10 or 15 faculty who were at that um, session, maybe about 10 of people who were in that session who were just like, I never knew that. 
And, uh, you know, so I don't have hard and fast numbers on it, but yes, we absolutely increased our permalinking from that and we're continuing to increase it as we are leveraging these resources. Okay. The next question is from Ann Williams. How well will this work with upper level undergraduate courses and graduate doctoral programs in professional fields? Do the resources exist for these specialty courses? Um, it, honestly, it depends. Uh, OER is, uh, a lot of people call it an emerging field and, you know, uh, it kind of is in a lot of ways, um, which is one of the reasons why we're doing this stipend program because we want to add to the growing body of OER that's out there. One of the um, projects that we funded is the creation of an OER textbook uh, for something that doesn't currently exist. Um, and the only al alternate is a high cost textbook. But we have, uh, I think, three different programs right now that have uh, either been funded or have proposed uh, projects that are for graduate level courses that are using either a combination of traditional OER, which is, you know, has the five R's involved in it, you know, the retain, reuse, remix, or are leveraging textbook affordability initiatives, um, which is library resources, fair use guidelines, and um, public domain. So, yeah, it, they're out there, but um, sometimes you have to dig to find them. Right. Um, okay, here's another one from, let's see, um, James Gilbreth. Are you having to fight back against access granted textbooks on your campus, which is the antithesis of OER in my mind, or um, let me let's see, or is that what you meant by the Cengage initiatives? Uh, no, Cengage is uh, Cengage is one of the uh, inclusive access access granted textbook programs that's out there, and yeah, we are trying to fight back against it. And the thing is, is they do a really great job of kind of co-opting the language of OER and selling it to faculty. Like your students have first day access. Everything is included. It's kind of turnkey. It integrates with your Canvas system. And um, one of the ways we're kind of pushing back uh, is like this summer, the first program, uh, the first uh, thing that we funded through our stipend program was this Lumen product because Lumen it has positioned themselves in the field to be a, a affordable alternative to the inclusive access uh, high dollar models that Cengage, McGraw-Hill, and Pearson have. Okay. One more. This one, well, you've got several more, but <laughs> next one. <laughs> this one by Diana Kell or Keel. Um, this is about accessibility. Have you found that OER titles meet web accessibility guidelines, work of screen readers? At my library, we cannot use any online resources that are not accessible. Um, again, it depends on the resource. Um, there is a huge push to make um, items accessible. Open Textbook Network, OpenStax, OER Commons, um, all are working toward making sure that their material is ex accessible. It's very, very important to me. Uh, one of my, my best friends in the, the library world is an accessibility coordinator and, um, and learning from her how important it is that screen readers work and uh, you know, text-to-speech works uh, is is incredibly crucial and important to me. So uh, it depends on the OER. And one of the great things about OER is that it is adaptable. You could probably take something um, that has a Creative Commons license on it, and if it's not accessible, you could make it accessible if you wanted to. Okay. Let's see. Here's another question from Stephanie Adams. How do you deal with streaming media that is only available from Amazon Prime or Netflix? I didn't think there were institutional subscriptions available for either. Yeah, we don't have institutional subscriptions to those. Um, our streaming media, we have Films on Demand, Canopy, and Swank. Um, and uh, that's what we leverage. Sometimes we just, we, we can't get get the films that are only on uh, Prime and Netflix. And that's when we default to buying in a, a, a copy for the course reserve shelf or for our circulating collection. Okay. 
Here's one by Teresa Schultz. Um, let's see. How did you market the workshops by Will Cross? Um, they, uh, they were uh, marketed through uh, our um, campus newsletter that comes out twice a week. Uh, we also did postcards that we put in all of the faculty um, mailboxes. Uh, we also, I specifically went to the deans of each college and said, this is happening. But really, once the word of mouth got out and they knew there would be a free lunch on the workshop day, um, everybody, we, I mean, we, we just, I mean, we had standing room only at each one of the sessions. So it was, uh, you know, at first I was watching the numbers come in and it was like a trickle and all of a sudden it was a deluge. Like we, we didn't have enough seats for everybody and that was fantastic. No, that's good. I work with Will Cross. I work at NC State. He's awesome. <laughs> He's the best. I mean, yeah. he really is one of my 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 yes. OER heroes. He is just, he's been mm -hmm. on my campus twice. I, I talk to him as much as I can. He's fantastic. Yeah, he's very approachable too. So. Mm -hmm. um, one more by Teresa. Um, who provided the funding for the incentive program? Oh, it's the provost uh, of our university. It's the provost stipend program. A lot of times it's called like a provost or presidential grant program. Ours is the stipend program just because that's the language our campus uses. Um, Dr. Alexander has been an enormous champion of OER. Um, he has been incredibly supportive for all of our goals, um, everything that the working group has wanted to do. And um, I, I wish everybody had a provost as as proactive as he has been and um, and who's willing to open up his uh, budget for stipends like this. Okay, the next question is by Jody Bailey. Um, what kind of representation did you have on your OER working group, i.e. what parts of campus do they come from? Well, initially the working group, like I said, was um, it was our cataloging librarian who had been um, our interim librarian for uh, a brief period of time. And then the head of our ed tech department, John McGee, and myself as the OER librarian, um, it was just the three of us. But when we were formalized through shared governance, when the president of the university sent the memorandum to shared governance uh, appointing us, we made suggestions because we wanted the committee to be, or we can't call it a committee working group, to be much more robust. Um, and that's when we added that we have a tenured faculty member, somebody who's gone through the tenure process. We have um, a faculty member who is at the instructor level. Um, and so she's non-tenure track. We have um, Bethany Green, who it works in student engagement, and she manages our student food pantry. So she's really tied into the community of students that are in need on our campus. And Tevin Pauly, who is our undergraduate student representative, he will be starting his junior year this year. Um, another hat that I wear is I teach first year experience classes each fall. And Tevin was in my very first FYE class two years ago. And um, he is just an outstanding human being. And when we were looking for a student, I said, I know exactly who I want on this group and I approached him and he said let's do this so that's that's kind of who we have now okay okay um, this one is from an anonymous attendee let's see when you put a copy of a textbook on reserves in service to all the students in a course how does that work of copyright it's it it's a fair use so it, it's not in violation of any copyright at all course reserves. Um, there is a, I think, is it Georgia? There is some state that has a, a lawsuit about this that's been happening, but um, having a, a copy of the book, you know, we have first, uh, we have ownership of that book and we can lend it to, it's the same as lending a book out. It's absolutely the same. So yeah, it's not in violation of copyright. Okay, here's one from Sarah Johnson. How do you keep stipend awardees on track and ensure that they are using or creating, adapting OER appropriately and not getting confused? 
Um, that's my job. And <laughs> the, the, the keep it, we just started, like, again, this just launched last month. Um, we've just entered our first set of agree agreements with the first five people. But one of the things that I learned from attending a presentation that uh, Karen did, uh, Karen Burke from um, Portland, was that, you know, you needed to have kind of concrete guidelines uh, and you needed to have um, benchmarks that folks needed to hit that there were deliverable times and so the stipends the way we we pay we're paying the stipend is per the agreement they get half at the beginning of the project and then we determine milestones for each of the projects and when they hit those milestones they get the second half and depending on the length of the project it could be like a midway point three quarters of the way through or at the end it, those agreements are tailored for each project and then um, those faculty um, they work with me and they work with instructional designers um, to make sure that uh, everything is accessible everything is canvas ready and everything is of the highest quality okay the next question is from rosemary burgess mira was your provost already on board with oer if not how did you get um, his or her support um, like I said, I've been very lucky that he is incredibly proactive. He was the one, he started uh, the month before I started and the library had been lobbying, this was three years ago, the library had been lobbying for about a year to get an institutional repository. He started the month before I did and said yes, like the month he started. When I was hired, I thought I'd have a year to kind of get a ground swell of support for an institutional repository and get faculty <laughs> demanding it. And instead, um, I started on August 1st and we had a contract for the IR that would start September 1st. And I was like, oh, well, that whole year just got pushed down to a month because I have an IR, but I haven't done any of the groundwork with faculty. So he is just incredibly, incredibly proactive. And um, I, I, can't say enough good things about him. That sounds great. Um, the next question is from Chelsea Idvo. Um, do you know of a way to encourage faculty to move to OER? I ask, as we had a situation with the history of psychology um, classes where the professor requested six out of print books. Yeah. Um, to me, that's an education level. Um, thing. So if, if the faculty is working, asking for books that are out of print, at that point, um, I would make sure that I had searched for um, alternatives. I would try to get their syllabus. I would try to see what their kind of learning outcomes and, and, and uh, their teaching rubrics were, uh, what kind of pedagogy they're, they're operating with. And I would offer alternatives and say, you know, those are out of print. They're going to be hard for the library to get. They're going to be hard for the students to access. But here are some similar items that are freely available for your students. To me, it's, it's, it's not that the faculty member is trying to be difficult, but a lot of times it's just a lack of awareness of what's available. And to me, it's a teachable moment with faculty. And it's an it's a opportunity for the library to kind of come in and say, we might not be able to do that, but we can do this. Okay. And I think we have time for one more question before we um, wind down. Let's see. Um, this one is from Sophie Rondeau. Do you favor open proposals versus affordable library materials proposals with your stipend program? Uh, we're doing both. Uh, our provost is very clear that his idea of uh, this stipend program is anything that will cost a student under $50. That's the threshold that has been set. So, for example, the Lumen pro, uh, product that we uh, purchased for an English class this summer, um, it was $25 per student. Uh, that was funded, but we actually ended up paying for that for our students. Uh, we figured... Um, it was, I think, $750 for us to pay for that for the students this summer. And we paid that and the rest of the money for the stipend went to the faculty member who was integrating the Lumen product into her, her syllabus. And it, to me, the dividends for something like that pay off because it tells our students that we really care about where you're at. You know, um, we're going we're gonna to have this online platform, but we're actually going to pay for this online platform for you. Um, I think it's another way um, our university indicates to our students that um, 
where they are at uh, financially, emotionally, physically matters to us. Uh, it's one of the incredible benefits of working at the university that I work at um, is that by and large, everybody who is on that campus really cares. And uh, we have a culture of caring on our campus. And um, yeah, so anything under $50 is a win. And it's something that can be considered for funding as long as it's leveraging low cost alternatives to high cost textbooks. Oh, thanks, Jennifer. That's great. And for those of you who didn't have your questions answered, you can look for those posted on the discussion forum. Um, thank you again, Jennifer. That was no fantastic. Problem. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, thank you to everyone for attending this NASIC 2020 session. This recording will be posted to our YouTube channel in the coming weeks. The speaker will be monitoring the NASIC forum through June 2020 for any questions covered during the session. Please join us again in 10 minutes for our next session.